Good morning, everybody, and welcome um, at our last Friday of the month when we always have our HIV and TB discussion meeting broadcast here live from the CMH Family Medicine boardroom, and we have a whole group of people here in the room with us. We are not expecting as many people to join for the online because we are aware of the fact that it's a public holiday, but this recording will be, um, this will be recorded and will be available on YouTube for later viewing. Um, so today we're actually going to focus again on tuberculosis and especially um, in March we had tuberculosis month and um, there's lots of developments also and new guidelines that's been coming out especially around screening and testing and in the next month or so we'll also hope for the final confirmation of the, the TPT guidelines. So uh, we would like to say thank you to Dr. Pile and Dr. Fuentes who's put together this presentation for us and Dr. Tijal Pele is going to be presenting this morning on TB screening and testing and I'm handing over to her now. Cool. Oh, um, good morning everyone. My name is Tijal Pele, one of the interns at Family Medicine um, in Cecilia Makiwane Hospital currently. Today I'll be presenting on TB screening and testing with focus on the standard operating procedure that was published in June 2022. Okay, so we're just going to start with some background. The TB burden. Then we're going to look at the TB symptom uh, risk assessment to see which patients are. Overlap, just a brief overview. For that, who to test and the frequency of tests the world, uh, we know that TB is one of the top communicable diseases worldwide. In 2021, 1 1.6 million people died of TB, and the African and Southeast Asia regions accounted for 82% of the combined total of TB deaths in HIV negative and positive people. In South Africa, um, unfortunately, we form as one of the one of the 30 high TB burden countries in the world. So the first national TB prevalence survey done in 2018 estimated the prevalence of bacteriologically confirmed pulmonary TB at 852 per 100,000 population among individuals 15 years and older. So from the WHO Global TB reports um, that was published in 2022 that looked at estimates in 2021, in South Africa specifically, the total incidence um, they estimated to be at 513 per 100,000. And of that total, um, more than half of, of those people were HIV positive. Um, we also see that the HIV positive TB mortality is far higher than the HIV negative TB mortality. So we know that TB remains a primary cause of age-related morbidity and mortality worldwide. So then again, with South Africa, total new and relapsed cases, um, only 62% were tested with rapid diagnostics at the time of diagnosis. Only 89% were known with the HIV status. 89% of these cases were pulmonary TB, and only 68% of these cases were bacteriologically confirmed. We can see that there was a higher um, predominance in men greater than 15 years old compared to women. Um, in the graph on the right, uh, with the purple and the green, we can see that um, males had a higher uh, predominance, especially in the 35 to 44 year old age group. So in terms of Buffalo City, um, Eastern Cape is one of the three provinces with the highest incident rate. And unfortunately, uh, Buffalo City does fall under one of the districts with the highest TB burden. Um, in a study done over a three-year period from 2013 to 2015, it was found that non-communicable diseases followed by TB were among the leading causes of death in the population over 50 years of age. And it was the leading cause of death among the 25 to 64 year old age group. So in terms of who we screen, essentially we screen all patients regardless of setting. So it can occur at a facility level, at a hospital level and community level. So facility level screening would occur at our clinics and community health centers. Hospital levels would be at the hospital OPDs and wards and community level would be at um, as part of outreach programs, including household contact tracing, door to door campaigns and wellness campaigns, such as Cheka and Pilo. So Cheka and Pilo is a wellness campaign that is, has a focus on testing and treating for HIV, TB, STIs, and non-communicable diseases. Um, the WHO does recommend that community-wide systematic screening may be used 
and settings with a TB prevalence of 0.5% or higher. Based on the National TB Prevalence Survey, um, we currently fall at 0.825%. So it's definitely warranted in our setting. So in terms of the risk assessment, um, so these are at people at risk for contracting TB. So we can look at a chronic medical conditions such as diabetes or chronic lung disease, specifically silicosis. Um, anyone with previous TB in the last two years, um, anyone who smokes or uses alcohol, because um, it's found that alcohol use disorder puts you at high risk. Anyone with a TB contact, um, undernutrition, so BMI less than or equal to 18, and people living with HIV. Um, I found a systematic review of the comorbidities associated with TB that was published in 2022 in the BITS Journal of Clinical Medicine, where they found that the most common comorbidities were HIV, diabetes, smoking, and alcohol. And the WHO in their global TB reports um, reported that cases were essentially attributable to five risk factors. So HIV, undernourishment, alcohol use disorders, smoking, and diabetes. So for our symptom screen, um, it can occur by two ways. So we can do a self-screening, and this can um, occur with a self-screening form, which I'll go into a bit later, and a TB check platform, which is an online service that you can um, do a self-screening with. Or it can happen with a healthcare practitioner where they ask you questions and then communicate the results to you. Um, these screening tests should be about five minutes or less than five minutes and should be available in a local language. So on the left, uh, the white form is a screening form, which I'll go into the uh, specifics of what that should include. And then on the right in the green, we can see the TB check platform, where essentially you just WhatsApp the word TB to that number and you get a free TB screen, which is data free. You don't need minutes, you don't need anything um, to be able to access this. So the TB symptom screening tool, we start off with our patient details, including um, their address and telephone number for contact purposes. Then we look at their medical history. So this is where we go through um, the risk factors that I just previously mentioned. So anyone who's a close contact of a person with TB and what type of TB does that person have? Um, do they have diabetes? Do you know their, Do you know your HIV status? And if not, um, it's a good opportunity to test at this point. Do you have a lung disease? Do you smoke cigarettes or tobacco? Do you drink alcohol? Or have you had TB or taken TB treatment in the past year? So in terms of the screen, we would look at the four cardinal features. So for adults, that's a cough of two weeks or more, or any duration if HIV positive, a persistent fever of more than two weeks, unexplained weight loss of more than 1.5 kilograms in a month, and drenching night sweats. And then for our kids, we look at a cough again, a persistent fever, documented weight loss or failure to thrive. We can check the Road to Health card um, book to see how they're plotting um, with regards to the anthropometry. And then if they have fatigue or are less playful, always tired. So at a facility level, essentially people would present to a health facility. They would be screened using the form, um, using the TB check platform, or using or via a healthcare practitioner. And if they have risk factors such as previously treated with TB, living with HIV or, or a household contact of a TB patient, which is defined as sharing the same enclosed living space for one or more nights, or up to eight hours during the day for the index patient during the three months before start of the current treatment episode? If yes, we would immediately collect sputum sample for testing irrespective of symptoms. If not, and there's no TB symptoms, this is a negative screen and we would um, provide routine care for whatever the patient's there for. If TB symptoms are present, we would collect a sputum sample for testing. At a community level, what's different is that the guidelines suggest that if a patient does not have any TB symptoms, that we should actually conduct a chest x-ray. So it's important to know that this is where available a chest x-ray may be conducted, as it may not be feasible to send everyone um, who doesn't have any TB symptoms for x-rays, just for screening. In terms of a hospital level, um, the only thing that's different here is that they suggest also screening for TB, sorry, for COVID, um, and you can also test for COVID at this stage. In terms of how they overlap, so we know that COVID symptoms and TB symptoms can be a bit similar with the cough, the fever, fatigue, shortness of breath. Um, they may also have a sore throat, headache, chills, loss of smell or taste, and arthralgia or myalgia. And we can just add a few extra questions to our TB screening questionnaire to cover for these symptoms. Um, in terms of who should be receiving chest x-ray screening, so the following groups of people should be considered for chest x-ray screening, irrespective of HIV status. 
So this is as per our guidelines. They recommend that people who do not present with TB symptoms, especially in high TB settings. However, this may not be possible in our setting just because we are a district with a very high TB burden and it may not be feasible to send everyone for screening um, x-rays um, due to our high TB burden. Um, other people who qualify would be people with TB symptoms other than a cough. If a patient is symptomatic but unable to produce a sputum specimen, parents and former mine workers with silica exposure, if a patient is symptomatic with a history of chronic lung disease. It's um, important to note that chest x-rays are not recommended for screening in children less than 15 years old, and a chest x-ray should not act as a barrier to testing, so upper referral is discouraged. So again, just mentioning that only if available, we can do the x-ray, but a patient should not be up referred to a, a, a separate facility just for a screening chest x-ray. Um, the, the WHO found that chest x-ray is a sensitive screening tool, but lacks specificity to confirm TB diagnosis. They also have recommendations on using computer-aided detection software packages. However, this is not uh, readily available in our setting yet. It hasn't been implemented yet. So I thought this was interesting. So the WHO for a screening test, um, they target a sensitivity of greater than 0 0.9 and a specificity of greater than 0 0.7. So it's interesting to note that the sensitivity of the four symptom screen is actually lower than a chest x-ray screening. And those are the two uh, screening options we currently have. Um, and sensitivity essentially refers to, as we know, accessibility to um, designate an individual with disease as positive and a highly sensitive test means that there are few false negative results and thus fewer cases of disease missed and we don't wanna be missing TB. In terms of um, people living with HIV, the four symptom screen actually has a lower sensitivity but when, okay, it has a sensitivity of 0 0.83, but when combined with a chest x-ray, it actually increases the sensitivity to 0 0.93. So they recommend that screening with a chest x-ray improves the sensitivity of the four symptom screen in people living with HIV. In terms of who must be tested, it's anyone with any TB symptoms, anyone with any close contact, which is defined as a person who shared an enclosed space, such as a social gathering, a workplace for more than 15 minutes over a period of 24 hours with the index patient, anyone with pre previous TB in the past two years, and newly diagnosed people living with HIV irrespective of symptoms. So frequency of testing will depend on which category you fall under. So in the general population, only if presenting with TB symptoms or if the chest x-ray is suggestive of TB, people living with HIV at the time of diagnosis on enrollment in ANC for pregnant women and annually linked to viral load monitoring follow-up visits, household contacts um, after each exposure to a person with confirmed TB diagnosis, and people previously treated with TB annually for a period of two years. In between our annual testing, people living with HIV and previously treated with TB must be screened and tested only if symptomatic. Um, when looking at the definition of a close contact, I thought about pretty much all healthcare workers, as secondly, we fulfill the criteria of a close contact, especially considering um, in OPDs and casualties, an N95 mask might not be available, usually isn't. So I found a meta-analysis that looked at the risk of TB infection and disease for healthcare workers. And unsurprisingly, they found that um, the prevalence of latent TB and incident rates of active TB was raised compared to the general public. So in terms of how we collect a quality sputum sample, we would have our equipment um, and the sputum collection would depend on whether the patient has sputum or not. If the patient does have sputum, um, this is just a quick video, it's like one minute long. It is important to collect the sputum sample right after you wake up in the morning because thick sputum collects in the lungs overnight. It is best to collect your sputum before you brush your teeth or use any mouthwash or before you eat, drink, or smoke. Sputum is thick, slimy, or sometimes runny. Color may appear yellow, gray, or greenish, and if there is blood in the sputum, it might look brown or red. Saliva or spit which comes from your mouth is not sputum. Saliva is clear and watery. Discard any saliva or spit. In order to test for TB germs, we need sputum from your lungs, not saliva from your mouth. Since the TB herbs can be released into the air when you cough, you should do your sputum collection away from other people. Collecting the sample outside or next to an open window is best. To cough up sputum from deep in your lungs, first relax 
and breathe in and out deeply three times. Next, take a deep breath and call hard to bring up speed from deep down in your chest. Try to cough up at least five to 10 milliliters, which is about one or two teaspoons. You can repeat taking in three deep breaths and then coughing hard to bring up more sputum. Make sure your sample contains sputum and not saliva. After coughing the sputum into the plastic container, be careful that no sputum gets on the outside of the container. Place the lid on the container and close it is important to collect the sputum sample right after. Okay, and then if the patient's unable to produce sputum, um, we would use nebulization. Or you can collect the sputum sample. Place the mouthpiece of the nebulizer into your mouth. Breathe in through your mouth and exhale through your nose for three to five minutes. When you are ready to cough, relax and inhale deeply through your mouth, hold it in your lungs for five to seven seconds, and exhale through the nose. Repeat this three times, holding each breath for five to seven seconds before exhale. Next. Take a deep breath and call hard to bring up sputum from deep down in your lungs. Cough and spit any time during the procedure if you feel the urge to do so. Try to cough up one or two teaspoons. Drink the water provided if necessary during the procedure. Okay. Before you collect the sputum sample, place the mouthpiece. Okay, so after we've after the patient's produced sputum. Um, like in the video, if it's purulent, if it's mucoid, if it's blood stain, that's okay. If it's just saliva, that's not good. And the patient mm -hmm. needs to try again to try and produce sputum. The quantity needs to be at least five moles. And at this time, we can opportunistically offer an HIV test to those who don't know their status or those who tested negative more than three months ago. So um, this slide for anyone who watched the uh, diagnosing TB at a district level done by um, Dr. Stead. Um, we'll be familiar with the slide, and thank you to him for um, allowing us to use the slide. But essentially, these outline the tests available. So we can use nucleic acid amplification tests. We can use microscopy, and we can use culture. And we use um, the Gene Expert Ultra, and it's supposed to be available, the results, same day. However, at CMH, it takes about 48 hours to get that result. And we need about 16 TB bacilli per mole of sputum for positive results. For microscopy, we use the oramine staining, and this takes about 40 hours at TMH. And this requires about 10,000 TB bacilli per mole of sputum. And then the culture gets sent to PE, so it can take six to eight weeks. And that can only be positive with about 10 to 100 TB bacilli per mole of sputum. So if Okay, so once we get our, our results back, if the gene expert is positive and the patient has not received TB treatments in the last two years, it can either be a in resistance, susceptible, or unsuccessful. If resistant, we need to submit a second sample for drug-resistant TB reflex testing and initiate on drug-resistant TB treatments or I prefer to a drug-resistant TB site. We would follow up the results of the smear, culture, and drug sensitivity testing. If susceptible, we would submit a second smear for sample, a second sample for smear, and initiate on drug sensitive TB treatment and follow up the smear results. If unsuccessful, we would submit a second sample for smear culture and drug sensitivity testing and initiate on drug sensitive TB treatment while we await the smear results. If the patient has completed treatment in the last two years, it can either be with unsuccessful, susceptible, or resistant. If susceptible, we can collect sputum for smear microscopy, and if smear positive, we would initiate treatments. If smear negative, we would first of all look at the clinical symptoms uh, and signs and do a chest x-ray if available and start on TB treatments if it is suggestive. If they are not, we would defer um, starting TB treatments until the culture and drug sensitivity testing is available. If a vampirin resistance and was previously susceptible TB, we would collect sputum 
for um, drug-resistant TB reflex and initiate on drug-resistant TB treatment or I prefer to a drug-resistant TB initiation site, as well as follow up the culture and drug sensitivity testing. If previously resistant TB, we would collect the sputum for smear and if smear positive, we would do the same. If unsuccessful, we would collect sputum for smear culture and drug sensitivity testing, and we would defer treatment until we can follow up the results um, of that of the sputum smear culture and drug sensitivity testing. If the gene expert is negative, so the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex is not detected. This will depend if the patient's HIV negative or HIV positive. As we know, in HIV positive um, patients, we get horse epicillary disease. So if HIV negative, we would review in a week. And if CB symptoms are still present, we would collect a sample for culture, drug sensitivity testing. We could do a chest x-ray if available, and we can defer treatment until we get the results back. However, if HIV positive, we would send a second sample for culture and drug sensitivity testing. And if there's no TB symptoms, we will continue routine care and follow up those results. However, if TB symptoms are present, so HIV positive and TB symptoms present, but the gene expert is negative, we would clinically assess the patient and do a chest x-ray. If there are clinical signs and symptoms suggestive, or if the chest x-ray is suggestive, we would start on, treat on TB treatment. If there's um, the clinical signs and symptoms are not suggestive or the chest x-ray is not suggestive, then we would defer treatment until we get our results back. If we get a gene expert that is trace um, detected and the patient has been treated within the last two years, we would collect sputum. Um, and if the patient's asymptomatic, we will follow up the culture and drug sensitivity results. But if the patient is symptomatic, we would start treatment while we await those results. If not treated within the last two years, we would do an x-ray if available. And if asymptomatic and the chest x-ray is not suggestive, we would continue routine care because that's we assuming that's negative then. Um, and if it is suggestive of TB, we would start TB treatment while we await those results. So just a summary, all people must be tested using the gene expert as a first line test. Previously tested patients must be tested using TB culture and drug sensitivity testing, so first line line per assay. Um, and smear microscopy is used as a baseline test following a positive rifampicin sensitive TB test result and as a monitoring test at seven and 23 weeks. The TB culture test is used if the rift testing is unsuccessful in people living with HIV with a negative gene expert and when drug sensitivity testing is required. Cool, and that, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. And you can see there are changes, subtle but important, um, in these recent guidelines that's come out uh, around testing, which people need to take hold, um, note of. Um, I want to add to one of the slides um, because I think this, this, this guideline is specifically focusing on, um, on your clinic setting. And we do occasionally see patients like this who is HIV positive with TB symptoms. The gene expert comes back negative. You do the x-ray, the patient does have some clinical signs and symptoms, but the x-ray is non-specific. The challenge is your patients with extra pulmonary TB, for example, patients who might have abdominal TB or splenic microabscesses or TB meningitis or spinal TB will all fall into this category. And so from a clinic level, these patients will be quite sick and you'll be up referring them to a hospital level or to a doctor for further investigations. Uh, for doctors and for our setting, in these patients, we will be doing further investigations to look for extra pulmonary TB, with the TB LAM obviously being one of, um, one of our key investigations we will use in our HIV positive patients, um, especially those with CD4s under 200. So just important in terms of um, if you're in a hospital setting, for example, a district hospital setting as well, is that we some, it's sometimes very difficult to get direct evidence of TB. So if they don't have a pleural effusion, you don't have a ascites, you don't have meningitis, you can't get a sample for micro, microbacteriological confirmation, you might have to look for other indicators that will give you a clue. It's like putting together a case mm -hmm. for TB. Um, and there's a few things we can do. So for example, you'll do your lab, but as we know, if the lab's negative, that is not very helpful. And there are some blood tests that are helpful. So just to remember CRP, 
not ESR because of the HIV, but CRP can be useful if it's very high to give us, make us suspicious for TB, to look at um, your hemoglobin. So a patient with a chronic anemia is going to make you much more suspicious of TB as well. And then for abdominal TB, we'd like to look at the ALK phosphatase and the gamma GT. So the ALP and the gamma GT, um, if those are high, that will make you very suspicious. And ideally, in those circumstances, you would like to get abdominal ultrasound to look for, for, for evidence of TB. If you're in a district setting... You might be in a scenario if you're in a very rural area that you're not able to access ultrasound or you do not yet have the skills to do an ultrasound yourself to look for these things. And therefore, if you've got a patient with a full set of TB symptoms, even if the CX X-ray is not suggestive, even if the lamb is negative, patient's not responding to a course of antibiotics, um, and you have a anemia, an increased ALP gamma DT, increased CRP, you will start that patient on empiric treatment and you would not wait the full six weeks for that four to six weeks for that culture result. So that I think that's the only thing I wanted, I wanted to add um, to this. But this guideline, I think, is very much looking at our ability to detect TB early. Um, and then just one another comment I would make in terms of TB especially. So if we think of COVID and we compare with COVID, and I want to talk about the mortality of TB. So the mortality rate for COVID, if you look at everybody that gets COVID, and this is old data from two years ago before we've had this sort of endemic um, change in the COVID epidemic over the last year. But in the two years ago, when we were in the middle of the pandemic, the, the mortality rate of COVID was 1%. So 1% of the people who got COVID, that includes everybody, children, asymptomatic, the whole lot um, would, would die from the disease. In South Africa, in two years ago, the data, the mortality rate for TB was 22%. This is for a disease that we are able to diagnose early. The Gene Expert Ultra has revolutionized our ability to pick up TB. And TB treatment available that is very effective in every single clinic in the country. Um, and this is where, that's why this TB guidelines, this screening and testing and finding people early and getting them onto treatment is so important. Um, because if you think, I mean, with COVID, it was amazing how we, you know, jumped on, everybody got involved, how good we were at screening and diagnosing and isolating and all of those things. And we have become a little bit passive and blasé around TB. Um, and there's very good evidence that if we did all these things, this early screening and testing, got people onto treatment early, treated them effectively, we will also obviously bring down an infection rate if we rolled our TPT properly. If we actually put all of these mechanisms into place, we could potentially break the back of the of the TB epidemic. And what's happening at the moment, it's just carrying on, carrying on every year. Everybody's just used to the fact that we've got this endemic TB that we're all just sort of accepting. And it is actually possible to see if we can if we can break the break the cycle. What has also helped with the COVID epidemic is the acceptability of wearing masks. So uh, mask wearing and TB is extremely useful for the index person to be wearing a, a mask or a cloth mask in terms of reducing the amount of TB that gets aerialized into the air. And so getting really good in our clinics with our cough policies, being able to identify people early in the morning that is coughing, providing them with a the mask. A lot of people now have their own masks that they come in with even and making sure they get seen earlier in the day um, and get therefore in and out of the queue quicker is a very basic way to help keep our facilities safer. Um, and so it's useful to look in our clinics, in our CHCs, are those cough policies still being implemented? Are we still being vigilant with our open windows and all of these basic measures that we should be taking, taking place? Um, I'm now going to open the floor for questions. Oh, just a reminder for those of you that are online, for uh, our attendance purposes, please put your name, your chat, and your either your SANAC or your MP number in the chat for us, so we can use that for the CPD. Um, I'm going to open it for questions here. We'll start off if there's any questions or comments um, from the floor here. Um, I'm just handing over to Dr. Fuentes. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. 
I think that is very important to remind to all of us that we have the habits that only test the patient when they are coming with positive symptoms of TB. But what we need to implement is the screening of all of population because South Africa is considered a, a country of high TB uh, disease. So we need to make the habit that everybody, in the same way that we offer the screening for HIV, we offer the screening for TB. Second thing, other challenge that we have is the notification of the patient. So the people are moving around. So we don't know when he present or she present to another institution. Is this one is a relapse? Is this one is a new case? Is this one is a default? So the only way to trace that one is if we notify the patient. Trace and screening the contact. This one is another thing. We only focus on the patient that is in front of us. So we need to call the whole people and the presenter may be very clear about the concept, what is the whole house contact, what is the close contact that we need to focus, okay? Very important, the family, the setting that the patient is working. And remember about the drug interaction that we have, because we're talking specifically for HIV population with our dolutegravir, with the people on protease inhibitors, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just checking out uh, the chat. At the moment you can either raise your hand or you can just put questions in the chat. Okay, there's no questions at the moment in the chat. Um, is there any last, it would be interesting, I don't know if anybody in the district Every now and then there's NGOs that has been sponsoring these x-ray trucks. There was one standing at once. I think it's been that they were initially sponsored through USAID for x-ray screening of the community. And I know at some stage it was available at Nantia Chambo. I don't know if anybody on the call here is aware of district screening um, using x-ray. Um, I know sometimes the NGOs do little focused projects on that. Do just unmute if you'd like to contribute. Otherwise, I'm opening the floor. Any last comments from here? Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I hope you have a lovely weekend. It's Monday, is, is a public holiday again, and we will make the recording available on, on YouTube um, on the WUSU Family Medicine and Rural Health channel. Uh, have a lovely weekend and goodbye.